One of my favorite things to do on this channel is to talk about the underrated and forgotten players of NBA history, which got me thinking, specifically, who are some of the most forgotten all-stars? Before we start, let me explain my one main caveat with this video. I'm only talking about players who were at minimum two-time all-stars. I think the strangest one-off all-stars in NBA history should be its own separate video. For now, I want to look at players who were legit stars for a brief window in time. I only have 10 today, so if you think I missed any, let me know in the comments, because I'd like to make a part 2 to this video. First up is Terry Cummings. He was a 6'9 power forward who played for 7 teams, but he was a 2-time All-Star with the Milwaukee Bucks. Cummings was great at shooting off the dribble, and he's also one of the most underrated offensive rebounders in NBA history. TC was drafted by the San Diego Clippers in 1982, and he won Rookie of the Year with 23.7 points and 10.6 rebounds. He beat out Hall of Famers James Worthy and Dominique Wilkins for that award. After two seasons in San Diego, Ago, Cummings was traded to the Milwaukee Bucks, and he became their leading scorer and rebounder with 23.6 points and 9.1 rebounds, which was good enough to earn him a spot in the 1985 All-Star Game. Cummings is actually the only player to ever outscore Michael Jordan in a playoff series, which he did in the first round in 1985. In 1989, Cummings was once again the Bucks' leading scorer and rebounder with 22.9 points and 8.1 rebounds. For his career, he scored 19,000 460 points. It's likely he's become forgotten because his two all-star appearances happened when he was playing in the stacked Eastern Conference, which had an effect on many great, but not superstar level players. Speaking of the East in the 80s, the next forgotten all-star I have is Kelly Trapuca. He was a 6'6 small forward who could score in a variety of ways, with his back to the basket, in spot-up situations, from outside range, or he could use his handles and get to the rim. Trapuca was drafted by the Pistons in 1981, and he had a great rookie season with 21.6 points, 5.4 rebounds, and 3.3 assists. He made the 1982 All-Star Game, and he actually finished 11th in that year's MVP voting. Trapuca had another great season in 1983, where he averaged 26.5 points per game, and he had a game where he scored 56 points while suffering from the flu, but he wasn't selected to that year's All-Star Game because he missed 24 games. Trapuca made up for it in the 1984 season, when he he made his second All-Star game with 21.3 points, and in that year's playoffs, he averaged 27.4 points in a first-round loss to the Knicks. After two years with the Jazz, Trapuca was traded to the expansion Charlotte Hornets, and in that team's inaugural season, he averaged 22.6 points throughout the year. Third, I have Larry Keenan. He was a 6'9 power forward who spent his best years with the New York Nets and the San Antonio Spurs. Mr. K had a slender frame. He's one of the greatest dunkers that rarely gets talked about today. He was also good from the mid-range, and his speed made him a good pickpocket. On December 26, 1976, Keenan had 11 steals in a game against the Kansas City Kings. Along with Kendall Gill, who also had 11 steals in 1999, that is still the official record for most steals in an NBA game. Keenan began his career in the ABA, where he was a three-time All-Star for 1974, 75, and 76. His first three seasons, he won a championship with Dr. J in his rookie season, and over those three ABA seasons, he put up 17.7 .7 points and 11.1 .1 rebounds. Keenan became a member of the San Antonio Spurs. When the ABA merged with the NBA in 1976, he put up 21.9 points, 11.3 boards, and 2.1 steals. Mr. K earned his his first NBA All-Star selection in 1978, with 20.6 points and 9.5 rebounds. He was an All-Star again in 1979, with 22.1 points and 9.8 rebounds. Next up is Otis Birdsong. For a short time in the late 70s to the early 80s, he was one of the hottest guards in the NBA. Birdsong was a 6'3 shooting guard, and he was actually the first guard to be offered a million dollar contract in the NBA. He was drafted by the Kansas City Kings, and in his three straight All-Star seasons from 1979 to 81, Birdsong averaged 22.9 points, 4 boards, and 3 assists on 51.8% from the field. His best individual season was in 1981, when he
when he dropped 24.6 points on 54.4% from the field, and he also made second team All-NBA. After four years with the Kings, Birdsong was traded to the New Jersey Nets, and he made his fourth All-Star game in 1984 with 19.8 points on 50.8% from the field. That postseason, Birdsong and the Nets pulled off their famous first round upset over the defending champion Sixers. Otis had another 20 points per game season in 1985, but by the time he reached his early 30s, his career would be ruined by injuries. Fifth on my list is Jim Paxson. Jim was a 6'6 shooting guard who made two All-Star games with the Portland Trailblazers. For a five-year stretch, he was a very crafty and efficient scorer, able to quickly cut and get open looks at the basket, shoot in spot-up situations, and shoot from outside. In 1983, he had 21.7 points on 51.5% from the field, and in 1984, he had 21.3 points on 51.4% from the field. He had his career high that same year, with 41 points against the Bulls. Paxson was also a solid pickpocket, and Clyde Drexler actually spent his rookie year coming off the bench for Paxson. That's how good he was for the Blazers. Speaking of the Blazers, next up is Kiki Vandeweghe. Vandeweghe was a 6'8 small slash power forward who spent his best years with the Nuggets and Blazers. Vandeweghe did a lot of scoring from the outside, with very good shooting splits. He's often cited as the innovator for the step back, but he also liked his pump fakes and he had a quick first step. From 1983 to 87, Kiki was top 5 in points scored, getting his high second place in 1983 for scoring 2,186 points. He did that while shooting 54.7% from the field, which was good enough to get him into his first All-Star game. He made his second All-Star game in 1984, when he averaged 29.4 points on 55.8% from the field. You may know about the highest scoring game in NBA history, when the Nuggets defeated the Pistons 186-184, to but what you may not know is that Kiki was the leading scorer. With 51 points, Vandeweghe joined the Blazers in the 84-85 season, where he had four more straight 20 points per game seasons. In 1987, he had one of the greatest non-All-Star seasons, when he put up 26.9 points on 52.3% from the field, 48.1% from three-point range, and 88.6% from the free throw line. If he had shot 2% better from the free throw line, he would have pulled off a 50-40-90 season. Phil Smith, the 6'4 shooting guard, had an excellent start to his career. As a rookie, he was a member of the 1975 Golden State Warriors, who won the championship. In Game 1, Smith dropped 20 points in his first ever Finals game. He wasted no time in his sophomore season, as he made the 1976 All-Star Game, 2nd Team All-NBA, and 2nd Team All-Defense with 20 points, 4.6 rebounds, and 4.4 assists. Smith was very athletic for his height. He was also good at posting up, and of course he was quick. Smith made his second All-Star game in 1977, with 19 points, 4 rebounds, and 4 assists. He had two more seasons where he averaged just under 20 points, but in 1979, Smith tore his Achilles at 26. He still showed off some talent in 1981 with the Clippers, but injuries forced him out of the NBA at 30 years old. John Drew he was a 6'6 small forward who spent his prime years with the Atlanta Hawks. He was an excellent scorer who was great at getting to the free throw line. In Drew's first game, on October 18, 1974, he scored 32 points, making him one of the few players that dropped 30 in their debut. For his first season, he averaged 18.5 points and 10.7 boards. Drew made the 1976 All-Star game for putting up 21.6 points and 8.6 rebounds. He would average 23.4 points and 7.7 rebounds over the next three seasons, but his next All-Star game came in 1980 with 19.5 points and 9.5 rebounds. Drew is one of many that had his career ruined by drug addiction. As a member of the Utah Jazz in 1983, he had to spend eight weeks in rehab, and Drew was actually the first player that David Stern permanently banned for substance abuse. Next is Bob Love. Love is one of the most underrated players in NBA history. The 6'8 power forward was able to shoot from outside, and one of his favorite ways to score was to shoot over his defender. Butterbean began his career with the Cincinnati Royals, but he developed into a star when he was traded to the Bulls in late 1968. Love made the 1971, 72, and 73 All-Star games, and over those three years, he averaged 24.7 points and 7.2 boards. 
He was also named second team All-NBA in 71 and 72, as well as second team All-Defense in 72, 73, and 74. Love was the main scorer for the early 70s Bulls, and for half a decade, they had multiple 50-win seasons and were serious title contenders in 1974 and 75. I definitely plan on making a video about those teams, and Bob Love especially. Last is Maurice Stokes. I saved this guy for last because I originally wanted to make a video dedicated solely to forgotten all-stars of the 50s, but I think Stokes is one of the biggest what-ifs in NBA history that deserves as much attention as possible. The 6'7 Stokes only played three seasons for the Royals. During a game in 1958, he had a bad fall which left him paralyzed for the rest of his life. His NBA career was incredibly short, but he made the all-star game and second team all-NBA in each of those three seasons seasons. When Stokes entered the league, he was already one of the most athletic players. He truly was LeBron before LeBron, as he was a stellar rebounder, defender, and facilitator. He was the 1956 Rookie of the Year, with 16.8 points, 16.3 rebounds, and 4.7 assists. In 1957, he had 15.6 points and 17.4 boards, but his best season was in 1958, when he posted career highs of 16.9 points, 18.1 boards, and 6.4 assists, while also having a league-leading 9 triple-doubles. Over those three seasons, he grabbed 3,492 rebounds, the most of anyone in that stretch. He also had the second most assists, behind only Bob Cousy. In my video about if the DPOY had existed prior to 1983, I went over why I believe Stokes could have won the award in 56 and 57. 